You're welcome back. You're still watching Signature Morning on Signature Television. We'll be switching guests with our another discussion. We'll be talking about critical shortage of heart surgeons in Nigeria. And we have Professor Emmanuel Jim, a cardiologist. Good morning and welcome, Prof. Good morning. How are you doing this morning? I'm all right, thank you. Fine. Okay, we are talking about heart. Yeah. So what factors do you think have contributed to the current so uh, shortage of heart surgeons in Nigeria? No, well, when you say heart surgeons, um, you know, in medicine, in, um, in medicine, the clinical medicine is broadly divided into medicine and surgery. Mm. Uh, so in internal medicine, they do treatments without them um, necessarily cutting. But in surgery, they do treatment by cutting. That's using the knife. Mm. So, so the people, people who work on the hearts in Nigeria, we call them cardiothoracic surgeons. That's what they call everywhere in the world. Uh, mm. So they don't, they don't just work on the hearts. They also work on the other structures in the chest. Okay. Uh, so Nigeria doesn't have um, there's no we have many cardiothoracic surgeons. So currently in Nigeria, there are about uh, there are just about fifty something cardiothoracic surgeons currently working in Nigeria. But um, like I mentioned, they they can work they work they work on the lungs, they work on the pleura, they work on the ribs, they work on the heart and all that. But what we, the the ones who don't have many currently are the ones who work who open the heart because you can work on the heart without opening it. You can work on the covering of the heart. Okay. You can work on the um, blood vessels around the heart. You can work on other things in the chest. But the doctors that we don't have uh, in the numbers will need them. And they do is who can open the heart on their own and work on the heart. Those ones are called the, they are the cardiac surgeons. As, uh, those are who work. Uh, so they, they, because in the past, they, actually the very first um, open heart surgery in Nigeria, in Nigeria was done in um, 1974 at the UNTH by Professor Fabian the day of uh, blessed memory. And um, it was actually the first surgery, cardiac surgery to be open heart surgery, open, that's opening the heart to be done in um, Black Africa, the whole of Black Africa, 1974. So uh, subsequently, Cardiac surgeries, heart surgeries, open heart surgeries were going on at UNTH for years in the 80s and 90s. When we were students, we were doing, watching cardiac surgeries like two times a week, Tuesdays and Fridays at this old UNTH. But the, the movement of UNTH is too close that affected a lot of things. Um, and um, then the number of people who were trained, many people left. Some of those who could have continued from where people stopped, many of them left Nigeria, went to the US, went to the, went to, went to the UK and all that. Just one or two remained. But, over the years, their skills went down and they stopped doing heart surgeries. So, in the, in the as I, earlier, as by 2013, there were now missions that is, people were coming from Europe, America to come and help us do surgeries, but they'll come do surgeries and go. Even the aim then was that when they come, they should transfer skills to the local surgeons so that over time, those surgeons, those are local doctors, could start doing the surgeries on their own without assistance or without help from the foreigners. But the foreigners were basically interested in just coming to do the surgery and go without any, any transparent skills. So that mission died. But there are some other places so in Nigeria where the mission was going on in so many places. It was going on in Enugu, it was going on in Lagos, it was going on in Abuja. Sometimes I think it also happened in Calabar. But by and large, the aim of the missions were not achieved. The aim of transferring skills to the local soldiers so that they could do cardiac surgery on their own. So, so, so eventually, some people went for training and came back because you know the open heart surgery is not just about the surgeon it's about a team of people okay. because it's not if, if the son is there without the perfectionist they cannot do the surgery if he's there without the cardiac anesthetist they cannot do the surgery if he's there without the cardiac nurses without the physiotherapy so it's actually a teamwork and the mistake most centers made that they'll just send the surgeon to go and train when the person comes back he has no way to work with that's that when people realize that they're not sending teams to go and understudy some big centers where open heart surgery is done, stay there maybe for months, come back and replicate what because when you do the surgery there as a team, when you come back, I mean, you know, the personnel is complete, it's only the equipment that may have been inadequate. So, some center like last week now, Lagos State University Hospital, they do open heart surgeries. Uh, Dr. Falashe is there, he is the one doing heart surgeries for them. Uh, then, at IFE, um, 
doctor not oil does open heart surgeries particularly in children here at the UNTH uh, professor Zemba also does open heart surgeries so those, those are the then um, I think somebody in Babcock also does open heart there are about four or five people who can comfortably on their own do open heart surgeries without um, assistance in the whole of Nigeria in the whole of Nigeria wow. those who can open their hearts not cardiothoracic surgeons let's say we have more than 50 cardiothoracic surgeons but not all of them can on their own open their heart some can open with assistance or with help by some people behind them right but those who can confidently and comfortably open their heart without that that's about five or six resident in nigeria but um dr osinzewi one of he was he was uh, he worked at UNTH, one of them who left in the 18 the i think 89 or early 90s he worked in the Belfast for many years retired but he comes into Nigeria to come and do heart surgeries for in so many places. Okay. He will come to do in Enugu. He goes, he has a place in Owe where he goes to do. He goes to Lagos, he goes to Abuja. But that's just visiting. So if somebody has a problem now that um yeah, and he's not around there, so so but so but if you have an emergency, the place can go, you can go to last week, you can go to if he's a, if he's a child, and then sometimes we enter to Enugu. Wow. Mm. Um you know, before you talk about surgery, you have to talk about the health of the heart. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a, when, when the heart is not healthy, that's when you start looking to do a surgery of it. Mm -hmm. What are the imminent foods that you, someone can eat? Or what are the kinds of exercises that someone can do that can improve the health of the heart? Okay, you know, disease of the heart, um, many, right? But to generally classify them into those the person is born with, we call the congenital heart problems, and those that are acquired as somebody is growing from childhood. So for the congenital ones, the ones like maybe a child has a hole in the heart, or a valve is tight, or is loose, or also there's abnormal communication between two vessels. Or, so those ones, uh, I mean, it, it, the person came with them into the world, so you cannot do anything about them. So those ones are treated by the pediatric cardiac surgeons. Then they close the hole, or they cut, an abnormal connection or they open up a valve right but for us adults the acquired ones in young people teenagers as children and all that there's something here we call them um, rheumatic heart disease rheumatic heart disease is um is an is an illness that uh, affects the uh, all parts of the heart it affects the covering of the heart it affects the muscles, then it affects the inner lining of the heart, which makes up the valves. So that oftentimes the problem is when it affects the valves, it creates problems. The valves may become dysfunctional. Either they are too tight to allow blood to flow, or they are too loose to allow blood to flow both forward and backward. Mm -hmm. But it's based on it results from an an infectious agent that causes sore throat. So when people have recurrent sore throat in childhood, the body tends to react to that germ causing the sore throat. And some of those gems share some properties with some things on the person's heart valve and the people's heart valves. So as the body is attacking that organism with antibodies, those antibodies also go to attack the heart because that particular organism has some similarities with some things on the heart. We call it autoimmune reaction. Mm. Autoimmune, as you're writing to yourself. Uh, so, so if that damage, so each time a person has a sore throat and the body fights the sore throat, but also fights the heart. So over years, the heart valves get damaged. And if the person doesn't do anything, so they want to do, to, if you notice that, start treating each time, you don't want the person to ever have sore throat again. So you can give the person prophylaxis for life to prevent sore throat. So if it doesn't have sore throat, the damage in the heart will not continue, so the person can recover. But if not, that stain continues, and by the time the person gets to 21 years, 30 years, the valve becomes bad. And I say the person has a rheumatic heart disease. So, and the treatment in this case is that the person has to either change the valve or repair the valve. But for you to do that, you have to open the heart. Mm -hmm. So that's for young people. Then in middle aged people, the commonest um, heart problems we have are related to things we call cardiovascular risk factors, which are things that will make somebody have a disease of the heart or a disease of the blood vessel. So those cardiovascular risk factors, the commonest one and the most important for us is hypertension. Because hypertension damages the heart. Diabetes damages the heart. 
if somebody has abnormal levels of bad cholesterol, can also lead to plaques that will damage the heart. If somebody smokes cigarettes, if somebody takes a lot of alcohol, if someone doesn't um, get involved in some exercises and all that, as if you're just sedentary, uh, if you um, take some, some from, take cocaine, for instance, cocaine causes hypertension and can damage the heart. Then uh, a few other things. Mm. So these are things we call cardiovascular risk factors. They are things that can make somebody prone to a disease of the heart, a disease of the blood vessels. Of course, adults, not children. Yeah. So for you to prevent heart diseases is for you to limit the number of cardiovascular risk factors that you have. Some of them are called non-modifiable. For instance, if you check the number of people you know that have um, heart failure, have had have, have heart attack or die suddenly, most of them are men. If you check the number of those, you know, who don't die suddenly, they don't want to sleep and die. But why is that? So because, so, so, I'm trying to tell you that, so the male gender is a risk for heart disease. So being a male makes you more prone to have a heart disease than a female of your age, right? So by the time women get beyond menopause, they tend to equalize, the, 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 the prevalence or incidence tends to equalize. So the female sex hormones seem to be a protective factor in younger females. Then of course, age, of course you know that as people get older, the chance of having a heart disease including heart attack, heart failure, or sudden death, gone higher. So you may not say that the child slumped and died. That is, that is uncommon, that is rare. But adults slump. So the older person normally gets the higher the chance of having a heart attack or heart disease. So you cannot do anything about it, about your age. Then heredity, if, um, for instance, your parents are hypertensive or are diabetic, the chance they are going to be hypertensive and diabetic is much, much higher than in, than in somebody whose parents are not hypertensive or diabetic. So your heredity is also a cardiovascular risk factor. So these cardiovascular risk factors are the things that determine or uh, things that uh, will um, predict who will have a heart problem or who will not have a heart problem. So in terms of diet, the, um, you know, the, um, sometimes we are on social media tell you that um, I say cholesterol is no longer a problem. It's not true. Mm. Cholesterol, bad cholesterol is a the, the, the things that cause heart attack or even stroke, there are things we call uh, plaques. You can like a plaque to maybe something like a chewing gum. You know, if you get um, a water hose, water pa passing through freely, if you get a chewing gum, turn on the side of the hose and maybe put a small chewing gum that has been someone that's chewed, put it at um, one inside the pipe, for instance. When water gets there, it has to struggle to pass through. Mm. If that chewing gum gets bigger, as water comes, it finds it more difficult to pass through. I mean, if it now grows and clo closes the place, when water can comes, it cannot pass through. So something like that happens in the blood vessels or that give blood to the heart or blood vessels that take blood to the brain. So those plaques are full of cholesterol. So cholesterol is the building block of plaques. But hypertension and diabetes can encourage plaque formation. But what they use, the, so the block is is cholesterol, but cement and water make hypertension and uh, diabetes that can encourage use, encourage use formation. So, so things that encourage, so if somebody's cholesterol level is high, the chance that person will have plaques is high. So if your cholesterol is high, already, there's no point adding more to it from outside. So that's about diet. Then, of course, if you're hypertensive, you need to control your blood pressure. If you're diabetic, you need to control your blood sugar and avoid the um, things that you ask not to eat and eat the things that you have to eat and take medications when necessary. So what about heart palpitation? Palpitation is a symptom. Just like like if um, if a lion comes here now, you have a palpitation. <laughs> That's a normal response. Okay. So but we now call it um, palpitation when it occurs for no reason. Mm. There's no fear. There is, I mean, you just always heart starts pounding. Because as you're seated, you're not aware that your heart is beating. That's the normal. When you become aware that your heart is beating, there's something that's wrong. That's what you call palpitation. So if it occurs, if you start, if you become aware that the heart is beating, then something that you don't need to look at your heart to know what is causing it. But the common that causes it is anxiety. If you become anxious, or if there is fear, something fearful happens. Of course, you have that's a normal response. Then some things you take coffee, cook, 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 cook take caffeine. Mm, some medications can cause palpitation. Then before you talk about illnesses. Cross-palpitation. 
how much of um, soda causes heart problems? Soda. What does soda contain? Just like you mentioned, Coke. So. I said Coke contains caffeine. Okay. Coke contains caffeine. Caffeine is what is the yeah, active problem. ingredient, yeah? just like in coffee. So, too much of caffeine can cause heart problems? People are different. So, if you can take a cup of um, Lipton that contains small coffee, I, I don't take Lipton, but it gives for application. But someone can take um, four glasses of um, coffee, they won't have problems. So, people are different. So, it varies from individual to individual. But caffeine is known, I mean, medically known to cause even hypertension, not just hypertension. What, what, what are other things that contains caffeine that we should avoid? Energy drinks. Those ones kill people. They cause sudden death. Energy drinks are full of caffeine. And then, um, sure, there are a lot of athletes who die suddenly while playing because they took a lot of energy drinks to give them energy. So energy drinks are dangerous. And so, some, even when they say the, the caffeinated coffee, they, it is not 0% coffee. It's not 0% caffeine. Just that the amount of caffeine is reduced. But you, you need the caffeine to give you that um, elation that you get when you take um, um, stimulant. Caffeine is a stimulant. It's a senior stimulant. So it stimulates the, the, the brain and all. So that you become, you remember, remember when you can take coffee and then you eat throughout the night. You won't feel hungry. That's why people take those things to be, to be alert and all that. But those have consequences. Okay, let's talk about the cardiac uh, doctors you know, in Nigeria. Is there any bottleneck you know, that stop people or so limit the chances of having medical or cardiac doctors in Nigeria? New ones from emerging. Right, right, I've told you that we have like 55 cardiothoracic surgeons, but not all of them can open the heart. So they those that can training. open the heart? Mm -hmm. You need, to go, you need to go. Well, first of all, you know, if you are, if you want to learn, um, if you want to learn how to repair a Toyota vehicle, you need to work under a boss who has a lot of customers that bring Toyota. So that's it. You learn better every day. If you work, maybe ten to twenty cars. If you are learning there, and then you compare to somebody who sees one Toyota, Toyota car in a week, the person who trains under somebody who does who works on twenty cars in a day, of course, will learn much much better. Than the person who works under a boss that sees only one Toyota in a week. Of course, this is medicine and surgery are like um, we do, the training is an apprenticeship. The more you do, the better you are. So we don't have volumes for training in Nigeria. Most of those who are doing this have gone overseas to train. But when you come back, you may, the facilities for for the job may not be there. There's something called a heart lung machine, for instance. Um, the heart lung, because you know, if, if if your heart is pumping like this, mm -hmm. you cannot cut, you cannot work on it. You, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. As the heart is pumping, you cannot cut on it without working on it. So mm -hmm. the heart has to be paralyzed, and another machine takes over the function of the heart. Mm -hmm. That heart ma machine is called a heart lung machine. Mm -hmm. I'm sure many people can, many hospitals cannot buy it. You know, just a, just so that machine is managed by a perfectionist. So when the heart surgery is going on, that person is, is in charge of the person's blood circulation, both the heart and the lung. That machine works out the heart and the lung. So that the, when the heart is paralyzed, the person cannot cut it because it cannot be oh, okay. pumping and then you're cutting it. It's not possible. Yeah, so, so, so when there is no volume, your training is deficient. So even those who are going to train overseas, they come back and then they maybe in a, a week, they do one, do two. It, those who are under you will not learn much. So because of this, Low volume of patients because it's expensive. Yeah. Short um, heart surgery is very expensive. If you go to change a valve now, you know where it will pay close to ten million. Yes. Well, no, this the dollar nonsense. Uh, because oh. this dollar because there's in the past. No, well, at UNTH in the past, we were charging like two point five million for valve change, maybe one valve and all that. When dollar was still um, less than five hundred naira. But now that dollar is one thousand. So if you go, if you go, I know that's sent from people recently to work. One of the paid eight million. That one paid ten million or there about. You go to Lagos, it's more expensive. Wow. Uh, so so many people cannot afford that. Yeah. Some people will prefer to stay, just be taking medication, and then wait for their death. Then wow. Go to look for ten million to do her surgery. But is there anything the government is doing, you know, to curb this thing? Is there anything? Is there any improvement in terms of uh, provision of facilities? For cardiatric uh, 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 medicine or treatment in Nigeria, or everything is just being pushed outside. No, you know the the, the, the what um, the, the Nigerian cardiac the society will belong to called the Nigerian Cardiac Society. Okay. That's um, 
Association of Cardiologists and then Cardiac Surgeons. No, we made a, made an effort to get the government to subsidize heart surgeries in Nigeria. In terms of because some of the, the things are expensive and they those consumables. Like if you want to change somebody's valve, the artificial valve is what it costs money. The other ones, of course, I mean, they already had the heart long machine. We have the personnel. That one may not be expensive, but you have to buy the valve. It's not made in Nigeria. You have to buy it from, from overseas. You have to buy the, some tubes and all that. If government can provide those consumables, the services people are going there today, not the services are there. So the government needs to subsidize. So because if you go, if you are registered with the National Health Insurance, say if you have malaria, with treat, if you have this, but when you have major illnesses, the insurance does not cover them. So if like the insurance is just for minor, if somebody is under N NHS, for instance, and has malaria, goes, he's treated, he has um, pneumonia, he's treated, and I say, ah, he has a valve problem. I say, ah, it doesn't cover it. You have to pay out of pocket, which many people cannot do. But the government needs to subsidize cardiac problem. I mean, cardiac, uh, particularly like cardiac surgery. Cardiac surgery in Nigeria for that, so that uh, those who need the surgery can, yeah, because have, they have the personnel, even though they are few. But when, you encourage, when they do more, as they do more cases, they become more proficient and train more people. But when, what, what can government do, you know, in order to incentivize more people to get into, you know, the doctoring of heart? No, like I said, the, the, so long as people want to go there because when you come out and after your training, you don't have any job, do you? Because one, you don't have the equipment to work with, mm. or the so your cases are too expensive, you cannot afford it. So you may stay for one year, you don't do any case, and then you start losing your skills. I mean, like I said, this is an apprenticeship, this is a So if you you need to be always be working so that you keep retain your skills, if you don't do surgery for one month, two months, then you get there, your hand will start shaking. Uh, so if the surgery is cheap, there are more people can afford it, there will be more patients, and the experience of those local surgeons can increase, can increase and improve. But as long as it is expensive and people have to pay out of pocket, mm. it will be difficult for our to, to have active cardiac surgeons working in Nigeria. So what alternative uh, alternatives do patients you know, in need of heart surgery? No, they wait do. for these, these missions. Like I know there's some, somewhere in um, Anambra, I think uh, John Willow, the one of the uh, cardiac uh, who stayed in America, John Willow, he built um, a cardiac center at uh, Addison. Yeah, also in Addison. Sometimes he comes around, they book some cases, he comes with some people, he sponsors them. For free? Finances them. So it may, so it may be a so that can cost, uh, cost, ordinary cost, eight million. They may ask you to pay three million or two million. Just out of charity. Then another, there's a foundation called Zoom Foundation. Boom is um, Vincent or Hadju, something, something. So he's, he did that foundation, he did it. Vincent or Hadju is a, is, a, is, a, is a surgeon, I think, yeah. So he did that the foundation um, in his, his father's in memory of his father. So he will come sometimes, he was coming to UNTH in the past, come with some of those consumables so that the people don't have to pay for the valve. They have collected it from the US or UK out through charity. The person will not just pay for the services, maybe the things uh, UNTH. So if government on their own side can make consumables available those who render this it will become cheaper uh, do you think um, artificial intelligence will play any role in solving heart problems well, people do robotic surgeries now and all that uh, which is what's all really about artificial intelligence uh, but, but um it will but we're not let's count one before we start counting two they may be doing that overseas in place where things are working but for now we're just uh, still at the elementary stages what about partnership with international bodies is Nigeria partnering with any foreign company or foreign government to cop or to bridge this gap between a patient that needs a heart surgery and, of course, the provision of cardiac surgeons? No, like when I say mission, most of those missions are partnerships between hospitals and groups overseas. For instance, when UNTED was partnering with Vroom Foundation, the hospital management would pay for their flight of the doctors the nurses, the professionists, keep them in a hotel. But they will come with those consumables, mm. come and render the services free. We will not pay them anything. So the patients will just pay for. So there have been a lot of. Say so many, so many groups. Is this still ongoing for? No, see, when COVID came in 2000, uh, yeah, we had COVID in Nigeria in 2000. Most of the, the mission stopped because of those 
those are travel restrictions. Since then, like for instance, you don't have any mission. One group came out from India sometime after COVID. They're the only one who have COVID. So most missions stopped after COVID. And then with worsening the economy and all that, um, paying for those things is no longer as cheap as it used to be. So what's the hope for common man out there, right there? No, the hope is that uh, no, we believe God protects us. So the hope is that God will continue protecting us and then the pray that we don't fall in. But if anybody falls in, and then there are patients there. There are, there are so many patients that need a cardiac surgery. And just, um, but the hope is that uh, we just look at them. Um, sometimes some of some some uh, some of these um, people in government who still have a human heart, sometimes they sponsor. So I mean, even many years ago, I had to one of my patients then, the local government chairman paid for her surgery. Mm -hmm. So those who have conscience, those who still have human hearts, could help um, people from their place, institute, uh, part of their consensus project. So at the time, time, time we compile list of those from different local governments. You know, look, this person is from your local government, it means two million naira for the heart to be repaired and all that. So let you know that just the part, of, part of the things we hope on. If we get such patients who we'll start them um, reaching out to people to know what we can help. Then Colonel Wampo, when he was in his foundation, we well, you know it was all about the heart. He has come to UNT several to come and help people. And he does it's highly subsidized. People don't pay much. That's so those things are affected by our bad economy. Because we still have to bring in doctors from overseas. Yeah. When they come for those missions, uh, so for, for for the heart now, um, for instance, I'm just thinking, um, what is the? I mean, for Nigeria, I know there are different causes of heart problems and heart diseases. Mm. But what what for you, uh, as someone who has an is playing in that field, what causes the most heart problems in Nigeria? For adults, hypertension, I mentioned hypertension. Only hypertension. That's the commonest for us in for, for, for Nigeria. Yeah. So, like, like I mentioned uh, the last time, I don't think you answered the food. What kind of food can we eat? What kind of drinks can we be taking that can improve the heart? We are encouraged to eat natural food. What do I mean by natural food? Fresh foods, grains, and all that. Not all these things that are packaged. Grains like what? Uh, grains that are like uh, serious. I mean, serious. I mean, like, the, the legumes and all that. Maybe beans. Just our natural food. Our natural natural foods, vegetables. Uh, apple is not fruits. part of them. Uh, that, is <laughs> no, that is part of them. They, they are natural foods. When you start going to eat uh, spaghetti, eat indomie, eat all those uh, processed food, they are not um, healthy. Processed meat and all that. Eh? But you get a get a fowl and kill and eat fresh, not the one. Fruits that are stored that has preservatives. Or you go and buy a macaroni and all that. It's those ones, those processed food items, they have things that are used to preserve them. So they're not very good for the body. But when you get natural food, natural food, they contain all the things that the body needs. So we encourage you to eat fresh foods. Like you go to your house and go to the back of the house and get vegetables and boil yam and eat it with it. Those ones are better than going to buy. Uh, Indomie or noodles and spaghetti and all that to eat because you're in a hurry. Mm. I'm going to eat at um, all these eateries and uh, eating a junk, eating meat pie and um, eating donuts and all that. <laughs> yeah. Just eat natural food, eat normal food. But, mm. And I'm just wondering, is there, uh, what was the role of sensitization? Is it actually ongoing? Because a lot of people, they develop this heart disease. They don't even know what to avoid. They don't even know what to eat. They don't even know how to manage their kids who, you know, who are having these symptoms. So how how is the sensitization like in the medical field? Is there an organization who is in charge of going to villages or just, you know, making sure that people know more about these things and what to stop or what to avoid from eating? No, like I told you, that there's um, a group called the Nigerian Cardiac Society. We just had, had a meeting, an annual meeting in, um, in September in Port Harcourt. Uh, a part of the thing, a part of the community, which was just to uh, increase awareness about heart. Because, you know, in the past, many years ago, when we were medical students, for instance, we were told that heart attack, they not that we were told that heart attack wasn't a common thing in Nigeria. Because even, if, even when you travel overseas and they did some did the CGs and it looked like it was heart attack and, I mean, had um, problems in the heart, the white men would think you had a heart attack when they take you to the catalog, you know, your heart is clean. So these days, the number of people who have heart attack in Nigeria is increasing. And it's partly attributed to maybe we have started adopting the Western type of diet. Eating um, 
If I ask one of one last time he ate uh, akede. Mm-hmm. One last time he ate a boma and all that. And then people now eat um want to eat shawarma. Uh, eat shawarma, eat indomie, eat um eat uh, eat uh, all, the, all those funny funny things. Eat spy and all that. And eat spy in the morning, eat in the afternoon and all that. So the um, association has made efforts over the years. Each time we have a, a conference, that, and then, then like last uh, some 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 weeks ago, there was the World Hand Day. Virtually all the hospitals, where there are cardiologists, did an awareness program. Measure people's blood pressure. Talk to them about them. Um, what is the reach? The reach, but most, mostly around. Well, I'm, 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 I'm sure that at least those in Enugu went to one of. I think Urban Radio or something and spoke to spoke to the public and all that. Many, virtually all the. States had a program to mark the World Heart Day, sometime just a few weeks ago. Again, when uh, sometime in May, we also do the World Hypertension Day. We we'll also go to so so many groups that are involved in cardiovascular health to reach out to people, particularly during those um, when we mark such the World Heart Day, World Hypertension Day, and all that. Part of it just believe we already don't know how, ask how many people listen to radio and all that, but we just try to make efforts, even though. Then there are people organize outreaches sometimes as part of it. I know UNT we did an outreach at Ichiko. But again, how many people are going to come there? Just stop with the villagers. But uh, the villagers are more interested in how to get food, not how to prevent, not how to treat hypertension. Because they tell people that when they eat food well, all illnesses will go. <laughs> <laughs> wow. It's been a profound conversation with you, sir. I mean, this is insightful. Um, this is one of the very important discussions I would always have to have because of the fact that it represents healthy living, you know. And I just wanted to, to just give us some advice, especially for the members of the public, on how to live going forward. Because again, sometimes it's our actions. Now that the economic situation is really bad, you know, uh, people tend to just find a way to survive, you know, and so they eat anything that can come their way. Um, can you just give us a few advice um, going forward and how to live a healthy life? Okay, first of all, if I, I'll ask you a question first, that when was the last time you checked your blood pressure? Uh, I think that's like three, three to four months ago. Right? Mm-hmm. So well, at least we've checked recently. So the for every adult, um, you should always uh, even if it's once in a month, go and check your blood pressure because um, blood pressure and hypertension is the, like I said, is the commonest risk for heart disease in Nigeria for adults. It is the commonest risk for sudden death in adults. It is the commonest risk for stroke in Nigerians. And most sudden deaths result right, from either stroke or heart attack. And hypertension of times are the baseline at, at the background. Mm-hmm. So, measure your blood pressure. That's the first thing I would say to everybody, we're adults. Always try and measure your blood pressure. If you don't measure it, you don't know when it is high or not. And hypertension has nothing to do with um, thinking. Not to say that they're not thinking about anything that they have. It has absolutely nothing to do with thinking. Really? Yes. Because I was thinking that there's, that that's when you think too much. That's when I, I that if that's the case, then all the students in the university will all have hypertension. <laughs> because they're always thinking about exams and all that, thinking about no money. So, so okay. it has to do with thinking. Uh, so hypertension often, like I say, oftentimes is genetic, hereditary, and all that. Uh, stress in stress could precipitate it, but even if it's stress, when stress goes, it should go. But stress will be um, on the background for someone who is genetically predisposed. Stress may make it manifest earlier than in somebody who is not. Um, for people in the village, they are presuming that when you worry too much. I said it has not to do with worry. It has not to do with worry. If it was worry, then students in schools will all be hypertensive. They don't have money. They don't have food and all that. Uh, then, so that's one. Then, eating, we should try and eat fresh foods as much as we can. Go to the market, buy food, cook, and eat. Don't, um, you know, don't feel that um, when you go start going to eat, eat out. That makes you a big person. <coughs> cook in your house and eat, eat. Prepare your food and eat it. Add all the fresh foods, vegetables, fruits, and all that. And natural um, grains. All those are traditional foods, are very good. Uh, and then don't well good at thing fuel is expensive now, so people now try to walk, walk, walk more. <laughs> <laughs> so, so try to be active as much as you can. So don't, don't uh, move from your car to the office to car, house to car. Try and uh, exercise the muscles. It will make it, it will help you to remain fit. Then um, then our people don't uh, believe in um, 
going for medical health check. It's not only for rich men. It's just like um, you buy a brand new car. So they will tell you after every 5,000 kilometers, you should go and change the oil. They're not changing the oil because the car is bad, because the car is um, not working. It's just to prevent the car from having a problem. So the same way, somebody who is healthy, from time to time, should go to health check so that you are assessed. They're not assessing you to, because you're sick. You're not sick, just to make sure that there's nothing that is coming up that can be detected early. early. So yeah. people should go for medical checks once a year for every adult, as much as you can. You check your blood pressure, pulse, do some tests, and they tell that you're okay. You go again next year. You don't wait because I ask you, okay, who is your personal physician? So I'm sure you have a personal mechanic who takes care of your car. You have a personal electrician who fixes things in your house. You have um, a plumber. You have, but who is your doctor? You don't have any because you feel that you're too young to fall ill. Illness, you know, nobody has immunity to illness. Anybody can fall ill at any time. So you treat, at least you have somebody who can, who knows your history. But even if you are at, um, if you are in Lagos and fall sick and some rush to the hospital, the doctor there can speak to the doctor who is seeing you. He will tell you, okay, look at this person's background information. This is what he has and all that. So it makes it things easier for whoever is seeing you then to at least have some background information about your health and then work on that. But when you are landing, because when nobody knows you, you maybe unconscious, everything will be tried. People will be trying to do so many things to arrive at a, at a, at a, at a conclusion about uh, your health status. So that's what. So your blood pressure, eat healthy diets, fresh fruit, fresh fruits, and then um, medical checks, mm. and then oh. keep fit. Thank you so much. Keep, uh, keep thank fit. Keep fit. Fruits these days are even exp more expensive than food. Mm. Days, I so. buy vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> Is that food? It's, it's, it contains a lot of vitamins and ingredients the body needs. Mm. Professor Emmanuel, thank you so much. Mm. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. For very, very important discourse. I would keep this um, our discourse close to heart. In fact, I think I would, uh, <laughs> I would even package this particular episode and keep it somewhere so as to be watching it over and over again because healthy living is actually very important. Thank you once again. We truly appreciate it. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Okay.